Well, hello everyone and welcome to Insight with Political Tours and Beyond the Headlines. In 2016, Adam Kucharski decided to write this book. It's called The Rules of Contagion, Why Things Spread and Why They Stop. It looks at the way ideas, news and diseases spread and how mod modelling can explain and predict their course. It came out in February this year. Hello, Adam. Welcome to Insight. Hello. Uh, it's a brilliant book. And um, if everyone read, watching this hasn't read it yet or bought it, you must buy it. Um, it's very, very readable. Um, and it, it's not dry science at all. Um, it's even got Goldilocks and the three bears in it. Um, so it ticks all the boxes. Um, People must have joked with you, Adam, a thousand times. What did you know back then when you came up with the idea that we didn't? Yeah, it's been um, been very surreal. I think timely has been uh, a word that's appeared in a lot of the reviews. And I think sort of revisiting it, having um, finished that that version before the pandemic, you know, seeing at the start of the book, the talk about kind of resurgent second wave type patterns, later in the book, talking a lot about use of data, use of privacy, these kind of trade-offs we need to deal with in terms of understanding um, epidemics. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's been interesting that some of these themes have, have continued through, but obviously as with every outbreak, uh, there's unexpected things that, that occur as well this year. Yeah, I mean, no, no doubt you'll be writing a, another tome afterwards to sort of re recap on what we've learned. Adam is a fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where he works on the analysis of infectious diseases and outbreaks. Um, he is literally on the front line of tackling COVID-19 and how to confront it. Um, we last spoke with you in March, um, just three weeks before the UK went into lockdown at a, a small meeting we held in London. A huge amount has happened since, not least of which is the fact that lot, most of us know a lot more about mathematical modelling and R numbers, more than you could ever have imagined, perhaps. Um, but just, just to start this conversation, can we get an, an overview of what we've learned about the ep epidemic since March. What, what do you appreciate now was happening back then that we weren't aware of? Yeah, a couple of things we have um, that are, are very useful compared to where we were beforehand. Um, I think, first of all, is just a better understanding of, of how transmission happens, where it happens, where the risk is. Um, the situation awareness, not just in the UK, but across Europe early on, was incredibly poor. I mean, we saw it with you know Italy, Spain, for example, you had you know, a few severe cases appear and then suddenly you've got a huge epidemic. And so the understanding of actually what was going on, what's driving risk, it really wasn't there. And now over the, um, you know, the sort of recent months, we've, we've got more resolution of, okay, these situations are, are going to be risky. These are going to be less risky. That gives us you know, some ability to, to think more about what's actually happening there. I think the other thing that's been very useful is actually just seeing international examples of what has and hasn't worked. Um, because, because this disease emerged in China, obviously the first example of what was, was being done in terms of widespread control was what China did early on in terms of their incredibly strict sort of draconian lockdown measures. Um, but I think now we have more international um, models to look at and, and sort of say, well, you know, some countries have done very tech driven kind of testing focused strategies like South Korea, some um, you know, like Germany have done a mixture of social distancing, you know, some sort of like Sweden have done this kind of more hands off kind of approaches, each structuring to their own cultures and societies. Um, so I think that's, that's an incredibly valuable knowledge base to then, you know, look at what we want to do. Um, you know, and many countries in Europe now facing kind of rising cases, what do they want to adopt to, uh, to counter that? What, what can you say more in the way that the virus spreads that you didn't know back then? So uh, some of the issues in terms of we, we've talked about um, not the R numbers, but the actual its ability to um, go from one person to another. I mean, you, you contrast with measles, which, for example, in a tube train could spread through a tube train very, very quickly. Um, can you just give us some, some of the ideas about the, the behavior of the virus and how it can, um, goes from one person to another? Yeah, I think there's there's been a, a real evolution in understanding um, and, and just a lot more evidence about that. Um, so a lot of the early focus was on distance. I think there was this sort of droplet based model where you can almost, I think people had the sense that if you draw a circle around yourself, you're safe within it. And um, yeah, outside that is, is where the risk is. But we've seen a lot of examples now of, of people who are in spaces, you know, whether it's gyms, whether it's in 
hospital environments, um, business meetings where they might have kept that distance. But, you know, if you're in a stuffy room with people for a long period of time, these aerosols can get across. So that's kind of this additional mode of transmission. Um, as you said, measles is this incredibly resilient virus that if you sneeze, it's going to infect a ton of susceptible people. We're not at that level, but I think um, there, there's more awareness that, you know, if you're in an indoor restaurant for a long period of time with people, there's these examples where, you know, air conditioning is just churning virus across the room. Um, and, yeah, that's the sort of dimension of, of transmission we need to think about rather than getting a tape measure out and thinking that you're safe. Right. Okay. Your job must have evolved. I mean, you, you have been in, under intense um, scrutiny, but also demand. Can you just give us an idea about how, how much you've been working and the kind of things you've been wallow, following? I know you've done a huge amount of varied work, but can you just give us an overview of what you've been doing? Yeah. I mean, I, I really see our role as just, just trying to provide evidence to, to a whole bunch of organizations and governments, and then you know, they can obviously use that to, um, to make the decisions that they want to. I mean, so early on, a lot of it, was just trying to work out the nuts and bolts of, of this virus, you know, in terms of transmission, what is that looking like, you know, in, in these situations where you've got close gatherings, what is the actual risk that people face in those environments? Trying to get a handle on severity was a big one. So obviously China, um, that early data, you know, we knew a lot of the cases weren't being reported. And I don't think that's a country specific problem. You know, we now see it across the world that, that there's underreporting going on. But it made it very hard to actually trust the numbers in terms of, you know, is it a 2% risk, a 1%, a half a percent? Um, so trying to really kind of narrow that down and, and work out by different age groups, what does that risk look like? You're talking about mortality. Mortality, but also hospitalizations. I and mean, I think for us, actually, the, the you know, mortality is an enormous concern, but also just how many people are actually going to need hospital treatment at one time. And actually, when you get into older groups, that that percentage can get quite high so that you know that's a, a sort of another layer of risk that you need to think about um and then I, th I think also more recently as we get more data available trying to answer those questions about transmission so these these concepts of things like super spreading how much does that happen um you know what are the environments that we need to, to look out for how much transmission could we potentially reduce by by sort of targeting certain interactions right um, the, the, I, I want to ask them to this one fairly early on that your book um, identifies, you know, fairly in, early on in your, your book about how diseases, um, whether it was malaria or um, I think it was typhoid, I'm, yeah, it was typhoid, um, and tracking down um, how those were born, how those were carried and tracing them and testing was a, as, a, as a key part of this. Um, why can you are you able i know you don't want to get too much into the politics of this um within the uk but why have we have we been so unable to provide a an effective testing mechanism to trace where the disease is i think um one issue is is capacity uh, i think for all countries i mean even even if you've got really good ability to kind of roll out on your you know say your private sector lab capacity or local um you know public lab, lab capacity you're going to have what's a gradually increasing capacity trying to compete with an exponentially growing outbreak. So I think if, if transmission is taking off, there will always be a point where the, the, the outbreak can just outgrow what you can test for. Um, so I think that was a, a challenge faced by a, a lot of countries. Um, but I think there have been, yeah, as we've seen, just a lot of logistical differences between countries um, and also just differences in what happen, happens when people get tested. Because I think we've seen in, in recent weeks across a lot of countries, you know, issues with, people trying to get a test and there's delays. And actually, if you get tested, you know, then do you quarantine, do you isolate? What are the, the either the support or the punishment, the kind of carrot or stick, however, whichever route countries decide to go. Um, and I think we've just seen a lot of variation around the world in that sort of package of how countries have rolled things out early on, and then what they've actually done if people do come back positive. And which countries can you point to that have done effective large scale testing? Um, so, I, th I mean, I think the example that a lot of people refer to is Korea. Um, I think one of the, um, the sort of aspects of their response, uh, which is, is quite labor intensive, but works particularly if transmissions at quite low levels, is they kind of identified these super spreading events and then tested very intensely around them. I mean, what I think a lot of us heard about the nightclub outbreak they had over the summer. What was remarkable is they just pulled cell phone location data for everyone who's in that area, encouraged them to get tested. 
Um, but of course, that strategy only works if you're at quite low levels. You know, if you've got tens of thousands of cases a day, there's absolutely no way you'd, you'd be able to just test everybody in every single district. Um, so I think that's, that's an example of, of a strategy that probably works up to a point. And then quite a few countries, I mean, Hong Kong was another one that had a lot of testing, but then had to sort of transition to this more disruptive, you know, getting people to work from home, starting to put, you know, time constraints and when things were open, because as I said, it's this, this competition between your, your capacity to respond versus the virus taking off. Mm. There are different kinds of tests um, that um, trace antibodies. There are uh, tests that try and replicate the virus where you have to literally send the sample off to a lab and they try and expand it to see what's in there. So that, that's a complex process that takes time. Uh, and I presume that what um, you know, the government here has been talking about is the ideal situation where you can produce rapid tests. Can you talk a bit um, about those? What kinds are available? Where are you seeing them being effectively used? If you can produce something within um, an hour and a half, two hours, 10 hours, a very short time period. Yeah, um, I mean, there's, there's obviously been a lot of um, coverage of this, some of it more, you know, perhaps more optimistic than, um, than where we are currently. But um, I think these, these kind of tests, I think, have a lot of use. And uh, I think we need to al always think about how we're going to use them because I think, yeah, especially if you've got a test with lower accuracy, you're probably not going to be asking people to self-isolate for two weeks off the back of that kind of test. But I think if there's something quicker, and there's talk of, in the US, for example, of these kind of saliva, you know, spit on a bit of paper type tests. And it's really just thinking about the, the different uses of testing. So one you know, is the kind of surveillance side of, we just want to know where the infection has been recently. So in that, in that case, you probably want um, to, to have an idea of where infection is. But you don't really mind that much whether people are highly infectious or, or less infectious because you're just trying to get a picture. But if you're trying to, for example, you know, screen people before an event, perhaps actually it's just the more infectious people that you're worried about. People that you know, were infected a week or two ago and just have fragments of virus, you're less concerned about. So it's, it's using those different sort of profiles of tests um, and tailoring them to the, the sort of risk you're trying to reduce. But I think for me, um, having those kind, kind of rapid tests, I think regardless of what your, your views are on, on how we should be approaching um, the, the kind of next stage of this crisis, I, I think having a rapid ability to work out where your risk is, is always incredibly useful in an outbreak. And I think the, the lower the barrier can be, for yeah, I think for all of us, having to drive somewhere, having to go somewhere and then wait for results yeah, that's just going to be a barrier to, to engagement. So the, the easier you can make it for people to get tested and you know, ideally reduce their risk before they're meeting people who are, who are vulnerable or, or in those risk groups is going to be incredibly useful. Uh, and, and in terms of the time scale, you've heard, we've heard some quite optimistic um, comments made about the test that could produce an, uh, a result within um, you know, minutes before you go into the theatre, for example. Um, what, what's a more realistic scenario? How, how, it, and I know that there's a test being developed that produces the result within an hour and a half, um, and that can be done, um, you know, within an office environment. It doesn't have to be sent away for a lab. It's a small handheld device, I think, that can produce the, the, the result. Um, how far are we from seeing those kind of things in, in circulation? Um, I think I'd hope that the, particularly the things that can be tied to environment. So I think this idea that we're all going to have something in our house that can do it in five minutes, you know, in the coming weeks, it isn't what we're seeing in terms of um, the, the various kind of development pipelines. But I think if, for example, workplaces could have something where they could do routinely, or if, you know, pharmacies or yeah, just something that would make it very easy for people. And even if it's not, say, um, you know, a 10 minute turnaround, but if it's something that you can get back in an hour. So, you know, if you're going to go to an event, um, you can have that turnaround testing beforehand and have confidence about risk. I think that that would open up a lot more options. I mean, obviously, then we've got that question of if someone is booked in for an event and comes back positive, what do you what do you do? Do you get them to isolate to get another test? I think that's that's the kind of logistics to work out. But I think hopefully in, in the well, certainly lit by, by the end of this year, maybe early next year, there's going to be a lot more capacity um, for tests to be available in, in much easier to access routine places. We did an interview with a doctor who was working on um, COVID wards um, in London, and she said that this is a virus that's never going to go away. It's just that we're going to have to adapt to it. Um, I, I presume that's what you think. 
um, how do you see our lives changing in the next, I mean, are, are we going to be coping with this within a year and a half's time? I know it's very difficult to put timescales on this, but people want to know, people listening to this are yep. going to want to know, is my life going to return to some form of normality in a year's time, in a year and a half's time, in whatever? Um, I mean, I think we, we're we already seeing improvements in our, in our understanding of this. And I think as we get more tools, I don't think it's going to be that we'll have you know, vaccine or something one day and suddenly we're, we're straight back to normal. I think what we're going to get is progressively better understanding of tools so you can kind of reduce the risk and disruption it makes to your life. Um, I mean, ultimately, the only way we're going to get back, I think, to, to a, a large level of normality is with some form of immunity. I think ideally um, that would be through a vaccine as, as soon as it can be available. But I think we are seeing globally, um, there's a paper out from Brazil you know, a, a day or two ago showing that that probably is accumulation of immunity that's turned over that outbreak. So in, in that population, that's what's going to keep the virus away. Um, and I think for, for all countries, it's really about navigating that path to if, if a vaccine is going to be available, say in the, the coming months, coming year, can we get to that point without causing huge disruption and um, a huge burden from disease? And, and I think different countries will be more and less successful about striking that balance. Okay, I, I'd love to start taking people's questions um, in, a, in a bit. So if people can start putting their questions in the Q&A box just below here. So if you can just type out your questions, we, we'll, Isabel will bring you up and you can put your questions um, directly to Adam. Um, I, I, I follow you on Twitter and I've seen some of your, you know, the, the analysis you've made of different places. Um, can you talk about the differences in, in the way some countries have responded to us or been able to respond and what that, and the influence of their society, their demographics, um, the way people live. So can you just give us a couple of examples of a, of a country where um, their way of living influences the way they're affected by the virus and how that works? Yeah, um, so I think, I mean, one example that a lot of people talk about is Sweden. Um, but I think the, the Nordic countries uh, are actually just quite interesting to look at social structure um, because average household size is, is much smaller than a lot of Europe and even Sweden majority of people are single occupant households it's very common for for people kind of leaving the, their parents home to go and live alone whereas London it's very common to have kind of large flat shares uh, in your 20s and because we have for this kind of infection a higher risk for each contact in a household versus the sort of contacts you generally make outside a household that tweak in population structure um, I suspect can explain some probably not all but some of the the difference we're seeing in, in why sort of Sweden and some, some of these other countries now are being able to have what look like lighter measures. Because I think that there are sort of fundamental differences in how people live together and where that risk is. Um, I, think, I, mean, I think another difference as well, which we've seen in, um, in Asia, is just what people are willing to get on board with in terms of quarantine. If you look at, for example, Taiwan, um, Hong Kong, a very kind of digital enforcement of quarantine. Um, there was that anecdote in the spring that someone's phone died and the police knocked on their door within half an hour to check they were still in quarantine. Uh, and European countries haven't chosen to do that. And obviously, if you're going to rely on that kind of you know, quarantine testing strategy, allowing people that extra freedom, which you know maybe a sort of more of a priority for a country, is going to sort of offset in terms of the effectiveness of that kind of strategy. Okay. Um, South Africa is another example. Um, I mean, many African countries, much, much younger populations, much poorer societies. How have they been affected? Yes, yeah, so I think, I mean, South Africa is a really interesting one. And uh, again, just talking about that global diversity, they had one of the strictest lockdowns in the world. And yet transmission kept on going up. So I think partly get back to that question of population structure, obviously, an enormous economic effects. And we're not just talking about the abstract here, I mean, it's people struggling to eat essentially um, meant that that I, that kind of measures those kind of measures weren't reducing transmission um, and we've more recently seen a lot of those areas ease off measures and still sort of see cases coming down um, and seeing some of the data come in I suspect what's going on is there has been substantial accumulation of immunity in the younger populations particularly South Africa that would kind of line up with the mortality patterns you see so they're, they're high but not the sort of level that you might see in a European country. Um, and it is probably that, that sort of combination of, uh, of very much flattening the curve, but also having that build up immunity, which is, is what putting them in the position they are now. So I'm not, not sure they can go fully back to normal, but they probably have a lot more headroom than a lot of countries. 
countries well, in what Europe. What fascinated me about that example is that alongside um, COVID, South Africa's got very high levels of, of TB and HIV, um, which would, I would presume, make their immunities, immune systems, you know, there are several million people who are infected by both HIV and TB, and that their immune systems must be compromised, yet you haven't seen an astronomical death toll go alongside it. No, this, I mean, I'll be honest, it is a puzzle. Um, because I think a lot of us would have would have thought, as you said, based on, on these kind of other comorbidities, that any advantage from a younger age population may well be offset by these other conditions that may increase risk. Um, but it, it, yeah, it is strange that we've seen, particularly in Latin America, a sort of pattern of impact that's very consistent with what we would expect from the early signs in, um, in Europe. I mean, really, some of the data on excess mortality Sort of three times what we saw in London, really kind of horrific impact. And yet we haven't seen that in, in parts of Africa, in you know, other countries, Pakistan, for example, as well, from the reported data that doesn't really line up um, with what we're seeing. So I think there's, there's definitely more to learn in terms of um, what the features of a population are and what the impact is of this virus. Yeah, it, it's too early to see it, but does that suggest that older, more developed, um, privileged societies are more vulnerable to this? I think based on what we're seeing, um, it, it does look that way. I mean, uh, there's, there's obviously the, the sort of behavioral and, and sort of social structure elements, which may be given, giving um, sort of Europe a, dis a disadvantage. For example, you know, in winter, a lot of time in, in closed indoor environments. Um, it may well be, yeah, these features of age. It may be co-circulation of other infections, which are kind of giving a heightened immune response in some way. Um, you know, other kind of seasonal features. I, I think at the moment, we're, we're kind of getting these in, interesting signals um, from a lot of places, but I don't think there's a totally consistent story yet. Yeah, I want to pick up on the example of Italy, which got hit very hard early on, and doesn't seem to be having the dramatic increase in numbers that we've seen in Spain, France, and then perhaps beginning here. Um, could, and, and that's been attributed perhaps to people's behavior. And I just wonder what you can draw from that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, in the, the sort of data we see about um, behavioural change, there does seem to be quite a lot of caution in Italy, um, which is, uh, is sort of maintained over the period. If you look at a lot of countries that um, got cases down quite earlier, so we're now seeing sort of in Czech Republic quite high numbers of cases. So perhaps there is this, this trade-off effect that countries that hit harder perhaps have this more residual caution. Um, but what, we've, what was notable actually about Italy is just the, the variation in different spatial areas. So the UK was very much, it was everywhere because everyone came back from their holidays and, and it was all over the country. Italy, it, it genuinely was more concentrated in the north. So some of the other areas haven't had huge levels of virus. So we would expect susceptibility there. And I, I think it is these residual, perhaps quite fundamental changes in behavior, which are managing to keep it low. And if if that's the case, I think, again, it's a very useful example to draw on. And that would go, I mean, obviously there's a huge amount of concern here as, as um, uh, restrictions um, continue for the next six months and there's a possibility of further in its restrictions that people, have, people are tired, people have had enough, people don't want to tolerate yeah. um, re reinforced restrictions and that's a contrast with Italy. Yeah, I mean, I think if every country is finding this balance and I mean, one of the things, um, that I think we can say about places like Sweden is the, the consistency of, of measures. I mean, if you look at, for example, the restrictions on gathering size across Europe, um, if, if you look at kind of where we are now, you know, obviously there's huge past impacts and variations there, but you know, the, the virus very much just cares about where we are now. So if we kind of talk about that point, um, you know, countries like Sweden have had fixed limit on gathering size, I think about 50 people there since March, that hasn't changed. Whereas all the other countries kind of went very strict, eased off a lot, now going strict again. And I think that is an element that, that that's probably much harder on people than actually just finding that balance um, and managing to keep it over time. So consistency is a, as, as a key issue. Okay, let's, let's start bringing in some questions here. We're, we've got Diane Cook. Um, and uh, Diane, if you just open your, your microphone. Go ahead, Diane. We can see you and possibly hear you if you uncheck your microphone, which is in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen. Can you see it? You're not, uh, your microphone's still off at the moment, so you just need that. Yeah, you go. I can hear you now. Go you ahead. You can hear me now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
my question, as you were speaking, was actually about what you think about the quality of communication, uh, official communication in the UK. Um, and there were a couple of things you, you described, for example, on testing, it makes perfect sense that um, if the virus is increasing exponentially, then in a perfect world, the testing would, but obviously it can't. And it seems to me that those types of messages really aren't getting across. And secondly, there's always the thing around risk, because everybody uses the word risk and they use it in, in different ways. And they don't always use it technically correctly. So I just wonder what you think about our, you know, our communication strategy. Um, so I, th I think there, there have been some you know, good examples in there, but I think there's also been some, um, some examples where it's been a bit of a mess. I mean, for me, for example, one of the frustrations, you know, the restructuring of public health England, regardless of whether you think that's a good idea, I don't think leaking it to a weekend newspaper um, is, is a good way of communicating um, what, you know, what should be done, basically. Um, and I think that, yeah, your point on testing, again, it's that, it's that kind of justification. I think the, um, what we're going to see, what we've seen already is things are going to have to change. Because I, yeah, I don't think any of us want to see things put in that are more strict than they need to be. So things are going to have to be added and, and relaxed and changed. And there's going to be capacity issues. And I think transparency is, um, is hugely important. And you know, one thing I have noticed internationally, I think countries that have done it quite well um, are ones where even if you might disagree with their strategy they've really laid out what their thinking is what their constraints are so then at least there's that sort of transparency and I think sometimes at times that hasn't really kind of worked in the same way and I, I think similarly with risk I mean um, I think it's been challenging in Europe but for example interviews I've done in the US as well I think at, at times that discussion of risk gets quite polarized um, that clearly this is a virus that in some groups is not severe. Um, and in some groups, it's very severe. And I think you know, we need to be upfront and need to, to give people that evidence um, to, to have the debate about what we do about it. Um, because I guess the connections between people make it very hard to sort of separate off who's at risk and who's not at risk. But I, I think we need honest discussions about what the impact of our different options are. So we, you know, we're not just looking at the um, uh, the epidemic it's all these other potential knock-on effects as well I, I think there's a real question here um just to pick up on diane's question about communication and uh, the scientists are coming under increasing scrutiny and in a second i'm going to take a question from stuart williams well let's take let's take the question from stuart williams and then I'll, I'll follow that up so stuart can you go ahead go ahead stuart oh hello um sir patrick Fallance, the chief scientific advisor tells us that the epidemic uh, is doubling every seven days or that's the forecast and he calculates that we will have 50,000 new infections a day by mid-October and 200,000 deaths a day a couple of weeks later. If you apply exactly the same method uh, going, going forward the entire population will have had COVID-19 and 11.5 million of us will be dead just before Christmas Day. Um, this sort of causes me to doubt the quality of some of the information which we're being provided by the government. Is, is that the maths, Adam? Um, so I think if, if it is doubling every seven days, over the over the coming weeks you know if that continues we would expect quite a lot of growth my my, my sense is it wasn't a kind of this is definitely going to happen but it's a kind of if it's the trend one but but as you mentioned um Stuart we need to be cautious about going further ahead in time particularly when we're talking about exponential processes because you you do get over longer time scale you know situations where the numbers coming out um just don't make sense I mean there was this example years ago where um, people were looking at a potential smallpox, like a bioterror attack. And I think there was a, some modeling that came out where they did extrapolate it over a year and they forecast 77 trillion cases. This was a, a US um, output. And obviously that's not going to happen um, in an epidemic. So I think there is this balance that uh, yeah, I think it's good to communicate the, the message of what exponential growth can do, because particularly in 
in early March, you know, we were in a situation where at the start of that month, we perhaps had a few dozen, a couple of hundred cases. And by the sort of three weeks later, we almost certainly had about 100,000 infections a day. So I think we have got examples of over a short period where this thing can, can accrue. But as you, as you say, I think we need to be cautious about the sort of time windows that we're talking about. And I think, yeah, if anyone was claiming that it was plausible that we'd be back in the millions um, or even into the hundreds of thousands, you know, arguably we're going to see behavior change. We're going to see other things happening before that. Stuart, well, are you, do you think some people are, do you think the scientists are scaremongering? And if so, what, what's their interest in doing so, Stuart? Um, I think they are scaremongering, and uh, I think they're, I think they're doing it to um, promote fear, uh, to enable the government to introduce restrictions, which, in my view, are not justified at the moment. Uh, and um, I mean, this question of uh, the earlier lockdown that. Uh, the number of cases uh, peaked very soon after lockdown. And um, just before lockdown, the, a doctor friend of ours who is working on the front line, he told us the date where it would peak. And that was the, you know, in, uh, in early April, and that's what happened. So um, it, my own view is that the... the um, the, the line taken by Sweden was right, uh, that that was the line which was initially taken by the, by the, by the uh, UK. And I think they were, they were scared by predictions from, um, not from epidemiologists, but from physicists who uh, scared the government. And uh, they, that's where we are. And I think because they, the government realizes that uh, they took the wrong route, they didn't stick with their original plan, um, which incidentally was the, was which the, what I understood that that was the, that was the best approach as put forward during our experts weekend, uh, that now they're they're in a sort of cover-up mode, cover-up trying to uh, uh, introduce, introduce these, these painful restrictions yeah. and uh, <clears throat> get in Sir Patrick Valance to try and put the frighteners on people. I, I don't want to the, the conversation to become too UK-centric, but at the same time, I think this is very interesting because we have had very high levels of the virus here and the actions of the government are controversial. So it is a very useful mm. e example. Um, Adam, there's, there's, there's truth to what Stuart says. The government has flip-flopped back and forth so much. People have lost, lost faith. Um, but at the same time, you, you're, it, it's, it's damaged the reputation of the, the scientists, but possibly unfairly. I mean, uh, Stuart has got some reason to say, look, this is, we've all been led up the garden path by this. Yeah, I, mean, I think there's a, there's a few points to pick up on that. So I think the first of all, this question about when the, the peak has, I mean, there's been quite a few different studies. I mean, to, to, particularly because the, the data we have are so bad that, you know, the, probably the best way to do it is the peak of deaths and then sort of trying to go back from there. Um, and I think assuming that everything made the difference on that day of lockdown obviously isn't capturing the full picture because a week before that, we'd had people being encouraged to work from home on the Friday, I think the schools closed, yeah, the pubs closed on the Saturday. Um, and then you know, a lot of people were, uh, were having venue closures and sort of transitioning to work from home. Um, so I think based on the sort of data we see, I think it's plausible that there was quite a, a reduction in transmission from those earlier measures. And probably by the time lockdown came in, um, there was already a pretty substantial slowdown. And the effect that that would have had was probably to bring it down faster rather than, um, you know, there was absolutely nothing happening to transmission up to that point, and then that did everything. And I think, again, the, the comparison of the Swedens, are, are, I think, is kind of useful one because a lot of discussion, I think, you know, now is, is kind of around lockdown or not lockdown. And I, I don't think anyone wants to be in a situation where we've got any, I mean, these are hugely damaging measures. Um, and I think we, looking back on that period, and you know, kind of as you alluded to, well, what kind of less damaging measures could have gone in earlier? 
and been structured in a way that, that would have increased our sustainability. And you know, Sweden did get a lot of people to work from home. They closed universities. They you know, had limits on gathering sizes. Um, I think limits to care homes on limits on, on sort of interactions with the elderly. Quite a lot of social distancing, you know, not to the point of closing things, but you know, pubs and, and restaurants still looked quite different. I think, as I mentioned, probably the household size there um, and the population structure helped a bit. But actually, if you look at stringency across Europe about a month ago, um, in terms of the different things that countries had, a lot of countries were kind of at the Sweden level. Um, so that, that probably suggests that if you're sort of trying to balance and keep transmission flat, that's the sort of level of stringency you need. So I don't think it was the case that sort of Sweden sat back and, and got herd immunity. I think they probably did manage to suppress the virus, perhaps with some immunity. But the difference in the curves, obviously, is that if you're, if you're kind of keeping it flat, Sweden had a much longer epidemic than a lot of other countries. And I think that is an important um, question to ask, essentially, that if we're, if we're trying to look at the options we have, it's obviously going to be far more disruptive to try and get transmission to come down quickly than to stay flat. So I think probably the optimal, um, if, if we're sort of talking about disruption, is a situation where we're sort of minimizing um, the level of, sort of damage and disruption to society but we're also doing it in a way that means that, you know, we don't have skyrocketing cases. And I think that's whether you're looking at Germany or Sweden or other examples, that's the sort of balance those countries have, have managed to find. And I think some countries got there earlier than others. What kind of incidents are causing the acceleration, have caused the acceleration in, in Spain and, and France, as far as we know? As far as we know. Um, again, it's, it's very... One thing that always happens with epidemics is a lot of things happen at the same time. So obviously schools are going back... Um, a lot of them were relaxing, as in, as in the UK, um, things on, on gatherings. I suspect because we can get these sort of super spreading events for, um, for COVID, the effect that actually is slightly counterintuitive, that if, if a lot of transmission occurs at these kind of super spreading clusters, it's almost like kind of throwing matches into a haystack. A lot of them won't take off because by definition, if you've got super spreading, most people don't give it to anyone. But once you hit one of these events, you get this huge amplification and it takes off and takes off. And I, I think probably looking at the, the sort of limits that were in place in, in, in France and Spain, it was that easing of gathering sizes, you know, bigger groups starting to interact again. And then it was really only a matter of time before you got some of these amplifications um, and you know, went from having a few hundred cases back up to, to 10,000 in some of these places. Okay. I'm going to come on to Sheila de Belague in just a second, but just before we do that, we, we mentioned schools going back, mentioned universities going back. Um, how, how do you, um, do you get a sense of how it's possible to contain um, the, the virus in those environments? At this, I, I recently heard, on, I think it was on PM program in the UK um, with Evan Davis, and we're talking about a budget of um, COVID, what, of freedoms of you know what you could have in you could have you could decide how much freedom you'd have within the economy but you could only allocate a certain amount of it so if you're going to dedicate that to schools you have to have less in restaurants and less elsewhere is that is that an argument that you um agree with um i think it's definitely a consideration that if yeah, if we want to keep transmission at a certain level um there's a limit to to, to what we can do essentially because we know if everyone's behaving normally we get the sort of growth that we, we saw early on. Um, and across Europe, you know, countries that have put in some combination of measures. And I think it has been quite interesting to see what different countries have sort of prioritized in that budget. Um, even if you look at kind of school reopenings, a lot of countries kept restrictions in and got schools open much earlier. Um, others, you know, Spain, for example, um, are only reopening schools now because yeah, events and other things have, have kind of gone back. So. I think this, this kind of concept of a budget, I mean, I, I, I think we shouldn't be too, too simplistic about it because we can, we can kind of enhance our budget by doing things more cleverly and, and learning more about the virus and getting better targeting and you know, this sort of thing. Um, but I think broadly that idea of what well, we can't, that can to some extent help what we're, we're sort of trying to do going forward. So, you know, if we're sort of saying we want to keep schools open because we think that's important, that gives us something tangible, which then can inform what else we do. Okay. Sheila de Blay, this is, you've got a question that follows up off the back of that. So Sheila, go ahead, go on. Okay. Um, there is an argument that because um, COVID-19 isn't as lethal as say Ebola, um, 
and because lockdown type restrictions have such a disastrous economic effect and also a bad effect on people with other health problems, um, the strategy should be to concentrate on protecting the people vulnerable to COVID-19 and otherwise letting people get back to work and if you like letting it rip in the rest of the population. It's not my argument but it's one I've heard. What do you think of that? Yeah I mean I think first of all we, we clearly can't stay in lockdown um, until a vaccine um, but I think also this the other extreme the kind of let it rip argument um, I think the the big challenge is just how many people in our population are are potentially at risk because there's clearly a very strong kind of age gradient um with particularly mortality with this so you know someone who's um about 50 has a, a zero about a 0.1 percent chance of, of death if they get infected someone who's 70 that gets up to to over one percent and so if you you know say you were to sort of draw the line at over 65s and you say over 65s we think of our risk group we're going to protect them um that's still about 20 percent of the population and I think I don't think anyone would want to see us basically locking up 20% of our population. So there's the question of, well, how do you allow those people to still have their interactions, um, but keep them safe? And then, you know, logically you could go down the route of, well, we'd want more testing of people who are potentially going to interact with them, or we need to be kind of venues they're going to go to, make sure that that's, that's kind of more secure. And you know, we're confident that there's not going to be infectious people within that. But when you start to look at the kind of social contact data for the UK, um, because quite rightly, you know, grandparents interact with grandkids, they're, they're of, often heavily involved in their communities. To do that kind of protection, you actually end up having to make wider society quite safe for everybody because, you know, you need to be testing their contact, you need to be um, putting measures to venues. And you can actually end up in a scenario where you're kind of actually suppressing the virus um, because the control measures you put in place to be confident that you're protecting the elderly have to be so widespread. Um, and of course, if you had a situation where you, you sort of let the virus rip and allow more transmission, um, that would probably be a situation where you're not protecting those groups as much because almost to allow that transmission, you to some extent got to take your eye off the ball and, and allow transmission to kind of, as we heard, escape the testing capacity and lose situation awareness. And I think... I mean, I personally do have that concern that if we're even if we're sort of talking about allowing people to manage their own risk, I think to have a large chunk of population with very little idea of, uh, of what their risk is and a widespread epidemic and they, they don't really know where it is. Personally, I, I think if we can get capacity having something where those risk groups can be far more confident that they can not be locked down, but also um, you know, not be exposed to infection. Okay. Um Adam, you, you must have um, dreamt about an influenza epidemic or thought about one. You almost must have relished it as an academic. Um, it, it, what has taken you by surprise in this? I mean, you, know, you, you, you obviously looked back at 1918. You, you, this, is, this is your job. Um, what's been, what did you not expect about this? What, what has taken you by surprise? This is obviously enormous, but it's not yeah. something that you hadn't thought about beforehand. No, I, mean, I think there are... There are quite a few similarities with flu of this virus, actually. I, mean, I think people sort of bunch it with SARS, but it sort of sits between the two. So in particular, um, you have a lot of transmission when people are mildly ill or don't have symptoms. That's obviously one of the reasons that flu is so hard to control. Um, the timescales are a little bit longer. So for flu, there's a gap of about three days between infections, whereas for um, the coronavirus, it's about five days. So if you're talking about sort of tracking down cases, you've got a little bit more time um, to work with. But it is actually striking if you look, if you go back through the, the kind of historical accounts of 1918, you, the US in particular introduced all these measures. They closed schools, they shut down, you know, entertainment venues, bars. Um, they, they had a lot of debates about whether or not to introduce masks. Um, they had a lot of debates about how sustainable these things were. So actually a lot of parts of the US introduced measures for a couple of months, couldn't keep it up and then sort of had transmission um, after that. So I, I think a lot of these things aren't actually particularly new. Um, for me, one of the big differences, though, has just been, I think, just the global diversity we've seen in, in, in how people are approaching these. And I think that will probably lead to some rethinking of actually how we approach the next um, 
through pandemic because a lot of these measures have actually suppressed flu as well. If you look at like kind of, you know, Australia and a lot of Latin American countries, they haven't had any flu really this year. Um, and that suggests that, um, yeah, I'm not sort of advocating these lockdown measures, but that measure does work on other viruses as well, um, which I think will kind of make people rethink about what is and isn't um, feasible. But I think for me, the, the big kind of surprise is just seeing global diversity. Because as I said, some of these populations now are going to be accumulating immunity. I mean, the, the cost has been enormous in some of these in terms of excess um, mortality. But you've also got countries now that are relying very heavily on suppression on closed borders. I think a lot will come down to when, when vaccines might be available. You know, say, say a vaccine that's effective and, and safe and works well isn't available for a couple of years. That sort of global diversity in what countries um, are done it, it, is really going to come under focus. And yeah, I think it's, it's going to be very interesting over the coming months to sort of see almost that separation between countries that perhaps have been hit very hard um, and, and sort of seeing a shift in dynamics, perhaps ones that have that, that testing capacity and that sort of digital um, approach to, to tracking working well. And I imagine a lot of countries in the middle where they're struggling to control it you know, they don't want it to take off, but they don't want to put the disruptive measures in place to, to, to sort of bring it so down quickly. That's a different contrast, because earlier we were talking about the contrast between less developed societies with younger populations. Yeah. We're talking about um, Western uh, capitalist societies with older populations. But what you're talking about here is a, a difference between um, Western democracies with older populations and Asian technically advanced um, economies that are ready to take these measures and they're going to be in a better position in six months time because we we can't cope. Yeah, I think a lot of it just depends on the timescales you're talking. So I think those countries, if you're looking at terms of infection levels, they're clearly going to have lower infections, lower cases over the coming months. Um, but it is that, that sort of question of, of end game. And if, it, if a vaccine isn't available relatively soon, then I think it's, it's going to be that question of sustainability. I mean, even if you look at um, you know, the US, for example, they haven't managed to keep it at low levels. And so what is that going to look like over the coming months? I think, yeah, globally, we're going to see real diversity in, in where countries end up. OK, and you're talking about the, the, the hit to the to countries' economies, essentially. I think every, I, mean, I think the virus has essentially asked every country to decide what they want their society to look like over the next couple of years. Um, and I think countries have come up with very, very different answers. Yeah, and we haven't agreed upon an answer here. We seem to be very think, divided and confused. I, I, I think, I mean, we obviously follow the news from, from many different countries and, and these kind of debates are happening everywhere. I mean, even in Korea, huge debates around, you know, they, they haven't got the very low numbers of cases that they want. Do they introduce more measures? Do they ease off and, and live with it. Yeah, I think we're seeing these deb debates in one form or another in pretty much every country. Okay. Unfortunately, it's a bit late in the, uh, the evening for our Australian friends. I can see one or two Australians listening into, into this. Obviously, very low levels of the virus there, but very draconian measures in, introduced there. So I'd love to, to hear some, from some Australians about that and then maybe put a question to Adam at the same time. Um, Pete, Pete Morris, let's get a question from you and then Andy Mendes after that. So Pete Morris, if you can go ahead, please. Pete, go ahead. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, very clearly, go on. Um, I've heard it suggested in Korea and I think Hong Kong that the virus is becoming more infectious and as a result, less deadly. Um, is there a reason to believe that? And is the inverse correlation between infectiousness and severity, which I heard suggested at the very beginning of this, is that a hard law or is it just a supposition? Do you want to really deal with the second thing first and then the uh, yeah. first um, So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of kind of theoretical work on those kind of trade-offs in, in sort of viral evolution. Um, I mean, I think the, just the characteristic of the virus that a lot of the transmission happens early in the infectious period, um, there's not much advantage for it to sort of change what it's doing later because that won't change its ability to get from one host to the other. Um, I think more, more widely, we haven't seen any sort of clear evidence that these mutations um, are, are causing notable differences in infectiousness and, um, and severity. I think one thing that has been uh, very unusual for this outbreak is obviously because countries close their borders very early, 
you end up with these kind of founder effects where, you know, if there is a mutated virus that happens to get into a country, that will by definition become the dominant virus just because the borders are closed so other viruses can't get in um, alongside it. So I think that that may explain why, you know, some Asian countries have variants of the virus that we, we don't have in Europe, in part just because borders kind of all shut at the point where these things were taking off. Um, but, you know, a lot of people are keeping an eye on these things because yeah, I don't think we can ever be too confident that a virus isn't going to um, you know, come up with some way of bringing us even more bad news. Okay, Andy Mendes, let's bring in your question. Andy. Andy, are you there still? Yeah, I'm, I'm here, Nick. Go on, Andy. Go on. I'm not quite sure what the question is anymore. Um, but I, I, I think you had an issue with Stuart's maths. And I, well, I, the, the, I think the, 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 I have a feeling there's a whole generation of small boys and girls across the world who's saying now, mummy, daddy, I want to be a statistician when I grow up. Because I think that I think the interpretation of the statistics is is fascinating. I, I'm a, a David Spiegelhalter fan, I must say. And I, and I think Stuart, I mean, Stuart started with us with with where the, the straight Patrick Valance ex, ex, exponential growth thing. And I have a feeling that 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 is, is entirely sensible statistically and, and scientifically, but it doesn't factor in the behavioral changes that 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 sort of huge epidemic spread has and it's interesting for me that the analogy is not with Sweden or even with with Spain it's probably with with the states where you have that sort of conflict between um, as, as, Adam, as Adam was saying sort of um, some fairly random attempts to control it at governor at, at state level with God knows what Trump's saying but but the balance between libertarianism and statism being much more clear it does seem to me that the state is, is, is much more of the example of where we may be ending up if we don't do things here. And certainly from my perspective, um, if we do get exponential growth, Sue and I are going to run away and hide. If we do get exp and that's the change of behaviours. As mm. it is, we're, we're living relatively normally. But it comes to a point when, you, when people, a lot of people will say, oh, hang on, no, I don't like that. I don't like the odds anymore. And, and so I think there's a natural... Uh, balancing of, of the, or, or mitigation of the exponent that, that's in there. And that's a very big ramble, but but to pick the bones yeah. out of that. Um, just, I mean, I think that there was a sort of fair comment about um, uh, the predictions that Patrick Valance was making and was saying that was just based on you know those figures if they were to continue under the same trend, and, and we're not saying they are. Um, so that seems to be a reasonable comment. Um, but it, w w what's the situation in the states at the moment, Adam? Is there? Um, and I know it's very hard to assess because you've got, um, uh, as Andy was saying, one state doing a different thing from another. But you know, just looking across the whole country, um, yeah, it, it's, is that growth still pretty rapid? Um, so, it's, I mean, if you look at the national level, it's been flat for, for a period of time. But I think in part that's because they've, it's local flare-ups. I mean, one of the features of epidemics that if you've got a lot of spatial variation with the sort of local outbreaks. When you sort of add them all up, you end up with what looks like a sort of flat bobbly curve. Um, I mean, for me, for me, one of the things that stands out is just the sort of fragmentation, I think, within the US. Um, and I mean, I think there are, particularly in the Southern states, illustrations that if, if you sort of ease off too much, you know, eventually the virus will force your hand. And I think even in some of those Southern states that were very adamant that you know, they were just going to reopen stuff. Eventually, the ICU started filling up and they had to do something. So I think even if there's debate about how early you act and how strict you are, you know, eventually, if your hospitals are filling up, you, you're going to have to do something. Or you know, as Andy said, people will change their behavior. Um, I think to some extent, when we, when we do scenario models and we have, you know, the epidemic where nothing changes, that scenario will probably never happen because if your local hospital is filling up, you're going to change your behavior, even if the government doesn't tell you to. Um, and I, I, I do kind of worry about some of those, those areas that, um, they're, they're not going to get, you know, to, to get transmission down at this point, um, is going to require so much disruption. As I said, you know, it's, it's sort of much easier to keep transmission flat than to try and get it to come down. Um, and so it, it may well be in some of these areas that, that they have outbreaks, they have hospitalizations, some immunity builds up, you know, those outbreaks get get sort of progressively less worse because of, of some accumulation of immunity. But yeah, it's very hard to see how they're gonna, that, that dynamic's gonna change substantially over the coming months.
Okay, I'd love to get Stuart Williams's comments back in because I know that the response to Andy Mendes is to say, Lord, look at Sweden, um, they're allowed a, a lot of liberty and, and man managed to keep the virus low. So I'd love to come back to Stuart in just a second. But um, Audrey Wolf, Audrey, I think is in, in Washington, DC. Audrey, if you can just open your microphone up, you can, you can ask your question. The microphone's at the bottom left. Hey, Audrey, there you go. Far away, Audrey. <laughs> Actually, I'm not in Washington, D.C. I'm in Martha's Vineyard, where, where it's much safer. Lucky and you. Uh, you, you just asked the question I wanted to ask about the U.S. I don't think we didn't have a whole lot of discussion about the U.S., but of course, our scientists like Fauci and, and Burks were sidelined by the president and they didn't they were well, their predictions were on target. They didn't scare us. I mean, I, I, I don't think they were sidelined because they were scared people, except that Trump didn't like this, the sound of it, and he doesn't think it would be good for his reelection. But they were right. They, they were absolutely right. I see Fauci on the sidelines, but he does manage to have these little chats that we can get. Uh, so the U.S. is top to 200,000. It's the big headline now deaths. And so I wanted to just ask pretty much what you asked, Nick, right before here. We are in big trouble because um, our leadership is not helping us. And the scientists are when they are allowed to come forward. We, we got a scientist right now who we don't really trust. Dr. Atlas, I guess. Mm. <laughs> Do you have anything further to say about that is what I want yeah. asking. Adam. Yeah. So, I mean, so quite early, early on in this, you know, back in back in the spring, we, we obviously look at a whole bunch of different scenarios. And one one we did look at is a situation where you don't have sufficient measures to kind of keep it under control. And and we envisage a scenario where eventually stuff will come in just to stop hospitals, you know, stop a kind of New York type situation happening again. Um, and I seeing the patterns in some areas, I think that's that may well be what happens. I, th I think there will be some states, obviously that. That kind of keep things down you know some of the um the areas i guess around the northeast you know have seen much lower levels but i think in some other areas yeah it's uh, yeah, i think it's going to end up being quite reactive and, and sort of always one step behind the virus um stuart i want to bring you back in because i think it, you, you i mean you really do raise an important point which is the economy has been hit really really hard if you've got businesses like ours we can't you know, we can't operate um, and that has to be a point at which you say, OK, we have to accept higher numbers of deaths uh, in order to, for, our, for, for, for society to move on. Is, it, is that fair? I mean, what, what level of, of deaths are you um, happy to accept, Stuart? Well, I, I think that's only part of the story, because I think what we're ignoring is the people who are not being treated for other illnesses. Uh, and I don't know whether I don't know whether any of our any of any of the people on this call have um, tried to get an appointment with a doctor or get treated. Uh, you get the most uh, you know, horrible run around by filling in filling in. About the UK, you're talking about the UK. Yeah. Yes, I'm talking about the UK. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know anything about the I don't know anything about the US, um, and so I think that. Uh, the attempted suppression of this virus is having untold consequences in other, other ailments not being treated, uh, and also the, uh, the economic impact, which will, have, uh, which will make people poorer. Stuart, just to, to, to follow up on that, what, what did you think of the, the programme to save the NHS? Basically, you go into economic lockdown in order to protect to enable the NHS to cope. What did you think of that at the time? Well, um, yeah, I was, uh, I, I think that the government was spooked by the scenes from Italy where there were people dying in the corridors, etc. And so because the NHS is so important to the, the population of the UK that they absolutely didn't want to see that happen here because if anything like that did happen here, it would be like a death sentence for whatever political party was in, in power at the time. Um, so uh, 
the measure that were taken then did in vertical commas save the save the NHS and it enabled capacity to be built up with the Nightingale hospitals. That's all great, but um, uh, talking to we, you know, we've got uh, we've got a friend who's on the front line with the hospitals in London, and he says that uh, there's they're uh, you know they're they're standing around waiting for COVID patients and they, you know, they're, they're neglecting, uh, neglecting other patients with other, other um, conditions. So okay. Adam, so the balance is wrong, really. I mean, the, the, it is true. There aren't any COVID patients. There haven't been any uh, COVID patients, particularly in London over the summer. Um, you know, we could have, we could have um, allowed the economy to, to get going a lot more. I mean, I, I definitely agree that we, we need to be looking at like health as a whole, that if, if we have things where you know the NHS is either genuinely overburdened or at risk of being overburdened, that's going to have knock-on effects on, on kind of other stuff in terms of um, of shifting capacity. I think I think what really depends going forward is what options we have and how different levels of infection will help that. So going back to this kind of this, the, the discussion we we're having earlier of if if you have you know more widespread transmission, how do you protect the risk groups? And I think a lot of that will come down to things like situational awareness. And then if you're talking about those more targeted measures, it's much easier to carry that out if infection's at a low level. And I think, you know, again, the kind of idea that we need to let it rip to, to have economies. I mean, across Europe, there aren't any examples. I mean, even Sweden have basically suppressed this, um, albeit with kind of much lighter touch measures. Um, and so I think it's very tough to see examples of, of any country that have essentially had that growing transmission um, without the sort of, Latin America style impact in terms of mortality. Um, so yeah, I, I totally agree with that point that we, you know, any, any way forward needs to be considering all of those things rather than you're just having sort of COVID cases as, as a single metric. Um, but I think there are advantages to having lower levels of infection in terms of the options that opens up for being more targeted. Okay, I, I know that Adam, you've got to go in a second, but I'm just gonna squeeze in one, one last question and that's from Fran Hoffman. Um, so, Fran, if you're there, uh, go ahead, go on. Go yeah, on. thanks very much. Um, I'm curious about um, what we know at this stage about the proportion of uh, different intensities of experience with COVID positive patients. Part of me cavalierly thought early on, I'll just get it and then that'll be fine. But then you read about people with much longer term problems with the um, uh, uh, virus on the one hand and the high proportion of asymptomatic people on the other hand. So what's the range and what do we know about the causality of that range? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great question. I think one of the challenges is because we're, we're still relatively early in that, you know, this, that if there are much longer term effects, the time just simply hasn't passed um, to study that. Um, I mean, there, there is evidence coming up. I think there was one out of, um, it, was, it was kind of military recruits of a recent study. Um, you know, looking at that kind of you know, knock-on impacts of what seemed like a mild infection, did that have knock-on impacts on sort of lung capacity and these sort of things? Um, but I think the difficulty is obviously just just getting what's a fair comparison, um, because yeah, if you have a nasty virus, if you have flu or something, that's going to knock you out for a fair period of time. Um, but I think it's it's crucial that we we kind of get a better um, handle on this. Because I think yeah, at the one extreme there's a tendency to to sort of particularly in, in some circles, you know, point to sort of a severe cases in, in children, which are obviously tragic, but incredibly, incredibly rare. Um, but then there's also the, the, the sort of um, tendency in some groups to, to sort of dismiss it as a threat in any group. And I think we, we need that nuance that I, I do think on the data we've seen, particularly for younger groups, for the vast, vast majority, it's not a serious threat. But I think there is this, as you said, on this sort of spectrum of severity, these perhaps longer term, more subtle things, which aren't so well documented. Um, and that will obviously shift that kind of equation. If we're talking about preventing cases, uh, it's not just about deaths. It's you know, even people who are in ICU for a period of time, you know, that, that leaves some really nasty ling lingering impacts. Um, and it's, it's weighing up all of those things versus obviously the, the enormous um, disruption that, that can come with, with widespread control measures. And the, the thing which really interested me in the, the conversation we've had is that none of us live in isolation of each other. So um, I've got children, they go to school, um, they don't live by them, themselves when they come home. 
you know, there, there's, there's contact there um, and people go to work, they have children, students at university, it's all interconnected. You can't separate these groups from one another. Um, so it's something we're going to have to wrestle with for some time. Adam, thank you very much indeed. It's been a really, really good discussion. I've particularly enjoyed it.